Welcome to the podcast for the West Side Church of Christ that meets in Killeen, Texas. Today we bring you another practical lesson from God's inspired word, the Bible. Last week, whoops, somehow I just skipped everything. How does that happen? Last week, we started talking about preparation. And I didn't get a chance to finish that, so I want to do that for you this morning. And we talked about preparation, and people think about being prepared for all these disasters and things, and that's important in certain places and ways, but that's not what Scripture is talking about, really, when it talks about being prepared. I think, of course, yes, there's a certain amount of wisdom in that, and good stewardship and whatnot when we're thinking about this world. You probably should have life insurance, for example, and other things like that that you have to have these days. We talked about how uh, we need to be prepared for righteousness. And this is a subject that, honestly, is what we spent all of our time talking about in some way, shape, or form. But this, this last couple of lessons, again, it's specifically with this idea that we can be prepared for these things. We must be prepared. We must prepare ourselves for these things. Ben Franklin was right. The author was when he said, by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. And think about that in terms of righteousness, of doing what God wants us to do, of being what God wants us to be. That takes a great deal of preparation if we want to be successful at doing this. And so we, we looked at some myths, like somehow you have to be naturally gifted. It's not true. Or you have to be super highly or specially educated. Not true. You have to be lucky. Now, you know, sometimes those things might help in some ways, but not for righteousness. God made us to be righteous. He created us so that we could choose righteousness. This is who we are. We often talk about how there's this human element that is evil and sinful, and unfortunately that's also true, which makes it all the more important that we need to be prepared to be righteous. We need to prepare ourselves to do righteous things. And we talked about the fact that there are some things we've got to have in order to do that. One is desire. You've got to want to do these things, or you just won't. That's, that is human nature right there. If you don't want to do it, you won't. Something can make you. This is why they pay us to work sometimes, right? There are always things in work that you don't want to do, but you get paid, so you go, and you do it. Maybe sometimes we need to think about our service as just that, as work. It's how important is work to most of us. Well, we need, of course, to take time. The cliche, everyone has the same 24 hours in a day, yes, but we don't all have the same schedule, and we do, again, make time for what we want. We need to make a plan, have goals, guidelines, etc., some kind of training regimen to get to the point where we are prepared. And honestly, another, I think an offshoot will be, we don't want to just be prepared, we want to be good at what we're talking about. Not just ready to do it if we need to but good at it, regularly doing it. We need to put in the effort, of course, to get there, to work at it so that we do become able. And then, of course, we need to pray. You just can't take prayer out of any equation and expect to be really successful at it. So this morning, I want to give us some examples. I'm going to give you three. I had two last week, but I needed another one to make it, you know, fit. So let's talk about three so, one of the things that Scripture tells us to do, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, we read it the other day, but Peter says, be ready to give a defense for your faith. And he gives us some criteria in there, and we need to be gentle, and so on. But the, the gist of the passage in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 13, is that you need to be able to tell people why it is you believe what you believe. That's it. And a lot of people say, I don't know how. Then I say, how do you believe it if you don't know how to explain it? It doesn't make any sense. What they're doing is really they're comparing it to, well, I don't know how to do it like you do or this person does or some person has been doing it for 50 years. <laughs> okay, that's fair. 
But you can and you must be able to give a defense to explain to people what you believe and why. And so, I, 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 again, for each one of these, I give you like three things that you need to think about that you need to have. There's more to it. This is, as sermons often are, somewhat oversimplified. But you've got to have knowledge. There is no substitute for knowledge. If, you, if you're going to explain something, you have to know about it. You have to have the basic fundamental knowledge. But again, they're asking, why do you believe what you believe? You need to be able to explain that. I do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, why? I do believe in baptism. Well, why? I do believe in this, that, or the other. Or not in this, that, or the other. Well, why? Again, you may not be able to answer every question. I cannot answer every question that someone's going to come up with. But we need to have knowledge. We need to begin working on those tools that give us the ability to know things. And, of course, this begins and mostly ends with the Word of God. We have to make time to learn about God, God's Word, and what He demands. And if we're not doing that, what are we doing? I mean, we're, we're just not doing the very fundamental thing that we're told we need to be doing. You'll never grow, you'll never mature in your own faith, let alone be able to articulate anything to anyone else, because you don't know. And there are a lot of things in the world that don't matter if you don't know them. But this one matters. This matters more than anything and everything else put together. That you know what it is that you believe. And why. And you know what? You may come to a different conclusion on some things than me. I can respect that if you've actually done your homework and you know what you're talking about. There are a lot of people who will come to different conclusions. You will never, though, grow in your own faith if you don't do the work to know what it's about. What is this Bible about? What is God about? What is Jesus about? What are the things that they demand? Because they do demand things from us. Behavior, thoughts, and so on. Well, it takes wisdom as well, not just knowledge. Plenty of people have lots of knowledge, but they don't have any wisdom. They don't apply it to their experience. We need to know how to make a defense. That's probably where uh, people go, I don't, you know, I'm not as good at it as so-and-so. Again, part of the reason is because you just haven't worked on it. You don't know enough. Part of the reason is because you haven't practiced. And so obviously you're not that practiced at it, that good at it. And that's fine. So you start doing that. You start working at it. You start practice, practice, practice. There's a lot more practice than there are games and sports. Have you noticed this? And if you played sports, you were like me, you complained about practice. Man, I hate practice. Practice is hot. Practice is boring. We've got to run laps. We've got to do push-ups. We've got to do all this stuff. We don't do that stuff in the game. The coach goes, yep. And I don't care. I'm getting you ready for the game when everything's on the line, when everything's important. And that extra step might mean the difference, you know, between victory and defeat. Stuff like that, right? All the stuff coaches say. And they're not wrong. Practice, practice, practice. Wisdom goes, I understand that I need to practice if I'm going to be good at anything, if I'm going to be able to function in any way. And so without wisdom, we then don't know how to do it, and we can't adapt ourselves to new people and new situations and new questions and new, new circumstances, right? So we need to learn the information, and there are answers and yet, sometimes those answers need to be gotten to in a different way with a different person. That takes wisdom and practice and judgment. If you want to be able to proclaim your faith, you've got to have the knowledge of what it is, the wisdom. And, and again, this isn't something that you need some kind of special talent for. You just need to actually put in the effort. And you need character. We, we talk about this all the time. I mean, you can proclaim your faith all day and be a super orator or whatever, but if you don't live it, it won't matter one little bit. And probably, no one's going to ask you about it if you don't live it anyway. They're not going to say, well, why do you do that? Because they won't know. Because your character's not what it ought to be. 
If you have poor character, no one listens, no one hears. Building good character, as we all know, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of discipline because it's difficult. Because most other people don't care about their own character. They care about whatever it is they care about, getting what they want. And so these are just some things that we need to have, we need to work on, we need to do to be prepared to answer for our faith. This doesn't mean you have to be the great orator and, you know, be Cicero up here and be, you know, this guy that's just going to sort of, you know, lead everyone into the promised land. I mean, no one does that, hardly. But you need to be able to explain what it is that you believe. And no one ever gets it 100% right. No one ever knows everything. Don't fool yourself into thinking that until I know everything, I can't really do anything. That's wrong. So here's some suggestions, some tips that you can use to be able to do this. One, read. You cannot substitute, again, the knowledge piece, right? The knowledge comes through God's Word. So read it or listen to it. Whatever, however you consume it, you must do so on a regular basis. You must do so on a regular basis. You must do so on a regular basis or you're not learning what you need to learn. Period. You're learning something else. Not learning God's Word. There are tons of tools out there that could help you. You know, there's the daily Bible in chronological order, which is kind of cool to go through sometimes. There's the once a day Bible. There's a bazillion reading plans on the internet. Or just pick one, or pick a book, or pick a topic and just start looking. Do it. Something. And you might start with. Why I believe what I believe. So you have to set aside time to do that. You know, here's the planning part of it. You've got to make some kind of plan, specific time, specific topics, searching the Scripture for answers. There are other tools, again, that are helpful. Lexicons, concordances, and commentaries can be helpful. But remember, the focus needs to be on the Bible and what it actually says. Lots of free... Uh, softwares and things you could get for your computer, your phones, or what have you that have a lot of this stuff. We have a million books back here if you want a hard copy. They're not organized very well, but they're back here. And there's all kinds of these things, but most of them are available for free on the internet thingy now. So y'all have access to those. Now, you might not know how to use them, and they can be dangerous tools if you don't know how to use them, like any tool. But they are there. We need to practice. So you can practice answering questions. Get questions. Look up questions. Um, you might volunteer to teach a Bible class because you know what? You're going to have to answer questions. And sometimes you won't know the answer to the question. And as I've said before, you, then you say, I don't know. Let's find out together. And that works here and that works out there. There's no better way to learn something than to teach. Read Romans 12. Practice that, right? Um, the first part of it tells us to be transformed. And then he tells us, well, we all have these abilities, so let's use them as best we can. And there's seven things listed there. Then in verse 9, he goes into this list of behaviors, right, that Christians ought to have. Read that. Practice that. Read 1 Corinthians 13, the passage about love, and practice that. Read Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. And practice that. Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and practice that. That's how you prepare yourself to proclaim your faith. You know what? All those things are important, whether you're just telling your friend why you believe that baptism is essential to salvation. I mean, it's only in the Bible every time someone say it, but don't get me off on that topic this morning. Uh, or to come up here and preach a sermon. All of this stuff is what you need to be doing. And it really is the same stuff, the same thing. Second point, we need to prepare ourselves to be hospitable. There's just one other, you know, one other example. Again, there's, I don't know how many of these things that we need to prepare, kind of prepare ourselves to be doing. One of them is hospitality. It is a command, 
Romans 12, 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Again, read Romans 12 and do it, right? Practice those things. Some of them you're probably doing, some of them you're probably not. So, practice. So we need to be given to hospitality. That means a whole lot of things. What does it take to help needy saints or to be given to hospitality or to help people in the community? What does it take? Well, it takes resources and flexibility and love, among other things. You can't hardly help someone if you don't have resources. Of course, you need resources. Like all resources, we must be good stewards of those resources. Whole lesson by itself here, right? If we, if we spend all of our resources, and by resources I mean money and time and things like that. It's not just money, right? If we spend or use all of our resources, we won't then have resources to help someone who needs it. Think about that. So it is on you and me individually to prepare ourselves to be ready to be hospitable. One, it's a practice we should put in practice regularly, but two, we need to be ready when the sort of bigger things happen. If you don't have the resources, then you can't help people. And, and essentially, you're being selfish. And in this state, in this country, the odds that you actually have zero resources are almost nil. They're zero the reality is we all have some. It's what are we doing with it? We need to be flexible. So you got to set aside resources, time, all these things for, for hospitality. Again, Romans chapter 12 tells us that we as children of God, as believers, need to be given to hospitality. And again, a whole lesson about who, when, how, and all that kind of stuff. But we need to be flexible. Like Paul was flexible, Paul, you know, became whatever he needed to be to help people, to teach people, right? You can connect that back to the first point also. You need to be willing to go where we need to go. Um, you know, so this might mean like, open your home no matter how nice or small or unnice it is. So what? Nobody cares. You hear that? Uh, there's going to be kids coming to your house. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to tear some of your stuff up. So what? You could either protect it or hide it, you know. I mean, when our kids were little, um, some of the older ladies didn't like to invite us over because Drew, uh, Drew and Nathaniel, you know. They were little boys, right? What did little boys do? Okay. You can, you can deal with that, though, right? You can... Put that stuff away, or just you know, or just decide it's okay. Whatever you can, you can be flexible. That's what I'm saying, right? Just, that's just one sort of example. Like, like my house isn't what someone else's house. So what? Be open to new and different experiences and people, right? This is a flexibility because we're going to be helping people doing things maybe we're not good at or don't want to do. Whatever we need to prioritize prioritize things like relationships over schedules. Have you ever noticed that, and, and again, we're kind of talking about two different things, right? We're talking about just in general being hospitable. We need to prepare ourselves and do this more. But what about the times when someone really needs help? Have you ever noticed that when someone needs help, it's always at the worst time for you? You've got to be flexible here with stuff like this. Here's a rule that sometimes I like to think about. It's better to have too much than too little. You know, you're hosting a meal or going to a potluck or helping someone in need, and they say, you know, bring this or do that or I need this. Do more. If I need 200 bucks to do this. Give them more. Go to the potluck, bring more. And again, if, if you really can't, you can't. I'm not, right? But prepare yourself. The third thing, of course, is love. We need care for people, right? In order to help people the right way, and, and keep in mind, right, 1 Corinthians 13 says, if we, if we do all these things and we don't have love, then we might as well just be that clanging brass and stuff. You ever heard the, the little kids, you know, play drums? Or I remember when I got my saxophone the first time in third or fourth grade, and 
I'm shocked that my father didn't just beat me over the head with it. It was bad. It was probably bad the whole time I had it. All right. Nobody wants to listen to that. We like good music. It needs to go together. It needs to sound right. That's the point Paul's making. It's, it's out of whack if we're doing these things without love. So love you know, should go without saying, but we need to. We need to have a care for souls. Without love, all the works don't matter. Without love, we come across as you know, hypocrites. Without love, what is our motivation then? I'm doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I want something in return. You're actually supposed to do it without wanting anything in return, right? Loving our neighbor, of course, should motivate us to give help to those who need it. So some thoughts here on preparing to be hospitable. Maybe it is a money thing, a financial thing. You know, budgets are good. They help with that. You can uh, do a lot of things and give yourself some peace of mind, live within your means. Uh, it can help clear off the debts that you do have, which is a good thing. Debt is a form of slavery after all, and we really don't want to be enslaved to anything but the Lord, do we? I realize, you know, debt's a sort of part of life, too, for most people. I'm not saying that it's wrong, but, you know, it'd be nice to put those things away, right? Sooner than later. And if we didn't have that, imagine how much more flexible and hospitable you could be. But don't get in the in the sort of a uh, spot where like, well, I have all this stuff going on, so I just can't do it. No, you can do it. You just have to want to do it. And so, yeah, you know, debts will help. You can set aside a little money, and probably you'll also be able to take that vacation you've always wanted to take if you take care of your stuff now better, right? So it's not just, it's not just hey, i got to save my money so I can help people. It's your money. Use it to enjoy it. Solomon says you're supposed to, but don't get it out of context or out of balance with spiritual things. Um, so again, you might just literally set aside some money to, you know, I got whatever to help people. And maybe that month you don't use it. Well, great, then you got more next month. Something to think about. Cultivate your relationships. You know, hermits can't be hospitable. They also don't get a lot of help. And you're going to need help at some point, probably. But if you're a hermit, how are you going to help people? How are you going to be hospitable? Read your Bible about God's love. Here we go again, right? There's no substitute for understanding and internalizing God's Word. Make a conscious effort to serve rather than to be served. Sometimes you need to be served. That's okay. But when, you're on, when the coin flips, and it will, again, we looked at this the other day in Ecclesiastes, right? The coin will flip. The tide will turn. And you'll be on the other side of that. And you'll be able to help. But are you ready? So sometimes we just, you know, we sort of, is this an American thing or a human thing? We just sort of back ourselves into a, maybe a financial corner or a scheduling corner or whatever. So we go, I can't help. We can. We have to really want to. And sometimes it hurts. And it's sacrifice. So again, that's where the love comes in. You need to be willing to do that. And the third thing is this thing about assembling together and worship and I can already feel the uh, eye rolls, but you know, here it is. You have to be prepared to assemble together regularly because God said to do it. This is also a command like being hospitable and proclaiming your faith. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What does it take to be prepared to assemble regularly, commitment, concern, discipline, among other things. I mean, you got to decide that's what you're going to do. I think all too often we haven't decided that. And so if it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, and I think COVID sort of did a disservice to many. And they thought, well, I didn't need it. I watched it on YouTube or whatever. That is not an adequate, by any stretch, substitute. It does not fulfill the command. And if you figured out that uh, it didn't change you at all, maybe it's because you weren't connected to the church rather than the other way around. And so, about this, commitment. We have to decide that we want to do it. We have to decide that that's what we're going to do. And again, as we've been saying all along, you will make time for what it is you want to do because that's human nature. You do it for everything else that you want to do. 
And so if you're not assembling, that says you don't want to. I don't know what else to say. It's not an option, so skip at your own risk. Number one, skip at your own risk. Number two, know that you are not helping, you're harming your brethren in the process because you're neglecting them. That's what the passage says is happening when we're not participating together in our assemblies. We need to understand that we're teaching people, especially if we have children, several lessons depending on how we treat that assembly. We're either teaching them that it is or it isn't important. Now, you may think it's not important. Well, God doesn't think it's not important. He thinks it is important. He set it up this way and expects us to participate in it. So you can think it's not important. I don't recommend that. You're teaching your children that it's not important. Um, You know, there's all kinds of lessons, like... You know, going to bed a little later on Wednesday is not going to kill anybody. Or whatever other night we might be assembling. Say we're having a gospel meeting or something. Never hurt anybody. Uh, They'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Again, there's all the reasons why we're not assembling together. And I've heard them all. I don't think I've heard any new ones over the years. They just get used to missing. Missing when it's inconvenient. You've got to prepare yourself. You've got to commit to assembling together. Are you going to be able to be there every time? No. I mean, if you're sick, don't come, please. If you've got a communicable disease, stay away. But if you're just not feeling good, you should probably come. If you're tired, you should come. So we need to have commitment. We need to have concern. Again, this idea of what are we doing in this assembly? Notice the passage says you're here to stir one another up, not here to get stirred. Now, you'll get stirred if you're, you know, remember that whole lesson where I had the jar? That was super annoying. If we rearrange our thinking to understand what's really happening, that one, we'll commit ourselves to doing it, and we'll realize that one of the core reasons we're here is to stir, not be stirred, but to do the stirring. So you think of your family. Again, there's a neglect aspect of it that we're not thinking about if we're not here. Again, there, there are maybe some legitimate reasons, but you need to ask yourself, is my reason really a reason or an excuse? If you find you don't miss the assemblies, then you're not connected. And you've got some work to do to make those connections or remake those connections. Think of these passages. Matthew seven twelve. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You know, that's the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Matthew twenty two thirty six. Teacher, you know this one too. What is the great commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Like, that should be enough, right? I want to I worship God as often as I can. I want to learn about God as often as I can. We've already talked about that. All these different opportunities we have, I want to take advantage of those things. This is the first and great commandment, he said. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. There it is again, right? Our love and concern for other people. So you need to decide that this is what you're going to do, and you need to have the concern to do it. Of course, you need to have the discipline. Sometimes you have to say no to something else. You may not be able to always. I get it, but most of the time we can. You just have to say, no, I'm going to be somewhere else on that night or that day or whatever. And you have to start planning your week differently. Again, like in our case, oh, Wednesday night, it's going to be late night. Oh, well, because I'd rather be with my brethren than whatever. Fill in that blank. And I'm pretty sure you'll find us weak. So, you know, you might have to set your alarm earlier. Oh, my. 
Here we go. Right? You might have to drag yourself through that door sometimes because, I don't know, you're, again, you're, you don't feel good, you are tired, you're whatever. You're, you've got other stuff going on, you're upset. A million things, right, could make it where I don't want to walk in that door. Do you think that never happens to me? And I'm, I, It's going to sound like I'm holding myself as some example and I always get, yeah, but you're the preacher. <laughs> Come on. Maybe you should think of it that way then. It is work. And I bet you don't miss work for those same reasons. So sometimes you just do have to drag yourself through the door. Why? Because you know it's the right thing to do. Because you know you want to stir people up. And again, you can't make everything. But you know, what does it come down to? Discipline. So some suggestions. Make it a priority. God does. You know, start working on that schedule to change it, to make sure you leave these times open as often as possible. Sunday, Wednesday, we got Friday night Bible studies, we got gospel meetings sometimes, you know, other times, and there's gospel meetings in other places. And again, I know you can't make everything, it's ridiculous to think so, but it's what's behind that when we're not making them. And so, if it's a scheduling thing, fix it. That's in your power, Right? If it's a tired thing, fix it. If it's an alarm thing, fix it. And again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not getting stuff out. One, that's the wrong sort of thought process, right? I'm not getting anything out. I don't, whatever. Well, start putting something in because that's really what Hebrews says. So, I mean, you don't know what I'm going to preach about a lot of the time. You know, usually toward the end of the week, I tell Marie and she posts it and whatever. And we're trying to do that more so you can maybe think about it. You know what the Bible classes are going to be about. And if you don't know, ask somebody. They know, right? So read ahead, study. You know, make yourself get involved. The classes you're sitting in, read it, read it, read it. I encourage you to read, again, Romans. Read Romans every week. The whole thing. You know, what about my other Bible reading? I don't know. You know, do that too or not. But read Romans every week. I think that will be more productive than just reading whatever, you know. Again, I'm not saying don't do it, but think about it, right? We're actually discussing it and talking about it. Read it every week. It's not that much more work anyway. Um, pray. Stop thinking about what you're going to get out of it or what you don't get out of it, and instead consider what you can put into it. Sing louder. Pray harder. Listen closer. Speak up more. Stick around and talk to people. Or... Get here early and talk to people. That's, that's a new one. Think about it. I know it might be hard, but that doesn't mean it's impossible and not worth it. Think about it like a job, if you have to. You know, we try to shy away from like some of that. Like, it's like if something we do is, we, is done because it's a duty, like somehow that's wrong. It's not wrong. It's what God expects from us. We're told when we do what God expects, we are like unprofitable servants who just do their job. We shouldn't expect thank yous and whatever. Just do it. And so, yeah, think about it like a job. You have to be there. Again, I doubt anyone has trouble really getting to work on time. Get some rest on Saturday night. Can't? Maybe you need to change what you're doing. You can go on and on and on and on and on about that subject, right? If you don't prepare for it, you're not going to accomplish it. You're not going to do it any more than you're going to be able to be hospitable, especially when it's needed. So remember, there's... Being hospitable, and then there's helping people in need. Those are two kind of different but related things. You're not going to be able to discuss why you believe what you believe unless you prepare yourself to do that. And if you don't know how to explain why you believe what you believe, you have to ask yourself, can you possibly even believe that? So put the time in to work. So again, ultimately, of course, it's God's Word, right? All of this always comes back to God's Word. Yes, there's physical things we can do, and... We can set our alarms earlier. If we're late all the time, you can. Or just decide, I'm not going to be late. Or just decide, I'm going to be there. Whatever. You can read more and study more and pray more. There are physical things, right, that we can do. We can save our money. 
Yada, yada, yada. But it all comes back to God's Word. God's Word is the thing that prepares us. Look at Ephesians 6. I think uh, this was mentioned last week or so. Ephesians 6, the armor of God. Paul wrote here, For we do not wrestle, verse 12, against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, and here's the key to this one, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith, yada yada. The sword of the Spirit. You ever gone anywhere without shoes? I know some of you maybe run around like sort of normally, but you know what you don't do? You don't go to work without shoes. You don't go to the store without shoes. You don't go to the, the restaurant without shoes. You put on the shoes that are appropriate for the thing you're doing. Try to fight a battle without boots on. All they, all, all they got to do is just, you know, kick you in the foot. You're done. Think about it. The gospel of peace is the thing that gets us ready for all of this warfare, all of this other stuff. It is the foundation for everything. The belt of truth, of course, sort of holds the armor of God together. There's another connection, right? It's God's word. 2 Peter 1.3 is divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. The real question, you know, is are you prepared for judgment? So we gave some examples of some things we need to be prepared to do righteous, to live righteously here. And there's a lot of those. But are, in the end, are we prepared for judgment? As Again, the Hebrew writer tells us, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Hopefully it occurs to you that these things we're talking about are preparing us for judgment. In being prepared for doing righteousness, we are preparing for judgment. Because we are judged on what we do. So again, as always, if you believe in Jesus, what are you waiting for to act on that? Will you repent of your sins, confess them as your Savior, be baptized if you haven't done that? Will you commit to a new life? Because you will come up out of the water a new person, but what are you going to do with that new person? Most of us have already done that, gone through that pro process, which again is a scriptural, legitimate, real process. So what do we need? What do you need? If anything, let us know as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have. If you are ever in the Colleen area, we'd certainly love to have you worship with us. You can learn more about us and our times of worship at westsidecolleen.com. Tune in next time and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me.